in the sort of the social center of the Manhattan Project. A lot of social events took place here. As with Oak Ridge, Los Alamos was built very quickly. Its accommodation consisted of temporary homes and trailers. Oppenheimer would later become known as the father of the atomic bomb. He was tasked with gathering some of the finest brains in America to work with him in this isolated location. You've just come from a prestigious university on the east coast of the United States or perhaps from Europe. You're recruited to work on a secret project you don't even know where. Then you're told to report to a train station in Lamy, New Mexico. First thing you ask is, where's Lamy? You're taken on a day-long journey over rutted, muddy roads into this encampment that basically looks like it comes out of the middle of nowhere. You're now told, here's where you're going to conduct one of the most innovative and creative scientific endeavors in the history of mankind. You might have thought that you were absolutely crazy and had gone nuts, but that was the reality of those days. It's clear that the conditions in which this elite group of scientists worked were very basic. This was a site that was built very rapidly by the army. They used whatever materials were available. They brought in lumber and they erected shanties and shacks in which they conduct experiments that were to revolutionize mankind. Over the course of three years, over 600 technical buildings were constructed. Now, only 30 of them remain in amongst the modern buildings of today's laboratory. John Isaacson and Ellen McGee are focusing on the site where engineers created the weapon to detonate the first atomic bomb. It takes detective work to piece together the details of what this building looked like and exactly what happened here. We're at a building called the Gun Site, or also known as the Periscope Bunker. And it's the site where the uranium gun device, the uranium gun weapon, was designed. The theory was simple. Shoot one piece of uranium down a barrel to collide with another. The two pieces would fuse together. A nuclear detonation would result. But in practice, the explosion had to be perfectly timed. This building was where scientific theory became an engineering reality. What was done here was working out the ballistics, muzzle velocities of these projectiles inside the bomb that were shooting into each other to see if they could get sufficient speed to have the weapon successfully assemble before it exploded. By studying the plans, our experts have discovered that this structure supported a tower that served as a periscope. This device would have enabled the scientists to observe and record each shot while they were protected from shrapnel in the building below. We're pretty sure that the, the inside of this periscope tower, uh, it was light tight, so that they would have probably been using it to um, take photographs of the actual tests that were happening right above. The presence of these bolts indicates where powerful naval guns were anchored to the ground and shells were fired in full view of the periscope. This is an area where we think that the uh, naval guns uh, were situated. You would have been able to have a clear shot between the guns mounted here and the periscope structure that is just a, a little bit to the north. Using their findings, the experts can now bring this lost world to life. The gun sight and periscope were built into the landscape, and the bunker was covered with a protective three-foot layer of earth. The naval cannon on top of the bunker would have fired the ordnance. High-speed movie cameras mounted in the periscope would have allowed the scientists to calibrate the speed and power of the explosion. And they would fire these weapons and they would understand in, with great precision and detail the speed of the projectiles, the time it took from the ignition of the charge until the projectile began moving. Those minor details were very important in ensuring that they could assemble the critical mass necessary to sustain the nuclear reaction. The tests at the gun site gave the engineers the data they needed to build a bomb they were confident would work. But then, a new scientific breakthrough indicated that it might now be possible to build a bomb from a new substance, plutonium, which would prove even more destructive than the uranium device. And this bomb 
would require the building of a totally new test site and would present the engineers at Los Alamos with their biggest challenge yet. This is the V-Site at Los Alamos, a collection of ramshackle sheds, abandoned for years. Our investigators are here because it was in these buildings that some of the most dangerous experiments of the Manhattan Project took place. By studying new evidence, it's possible to understand what this lost world looked like and what happened here. By 1944, a uranium-fueled nuclear bomb was near completion. But scientists at Los Alamos had been presented with another possibility, to make an even more destructive bomb from a different kind of fuel. This totally new material that was discovered, and that is plutonium, uh, and the scientists had actually been able to do enough calculations to try to understand that plutonium would probably be a better bomb than uranium. So a new race was underway. A whole complex of buildings was constructed at Los Alamos. This area is called V-Site, but during the war, this was actually called Technical Area 25. They, they came out here and used this little area as a special sort of um, high security secret area for working on the implosion device. The engineers were entering uncharted territory but they knew that what they were going to attempt was highly dangerous and would require a new type of explosives research. The idea is to start with a sphere of plutonium and to compress it using high explosives to a point where now it could sustain a critical reaction. This was a challenge for explosive development. Normally with explosives we would blow things up, not try to blow them inward. And so the implosion concept was created. The military needed this work done fast, so no time was lost in building the explosives workshops. A lot of this stuff was salvaged from other construction Absolutely. projects because when they decided to build this area, it was just like, come on, we got to get a place to put this together, grab some stuff from other places around the, la uh, around the laboratory and throw it together and get us a building as quick as you can. The designers knew that the people working at the V-Site would be handling powerful, often unstable, high explosives. The experts have been able to identify a series of safety precautions which were built. This is part of a, a, a surface that was around the buildings in this whole area. And this is a, a spark a suppressant material that was on the ground because they're working with high explosives. There wasn't just the threat of sparks. There was also New Mexico's freak weather to contend with. This is one of the highest lightning strike areas in the United States. So uh, during the summer, during the monsoon period, we get lots of lightning. And so lightning is a major issue in this whole high explosives area. The engineer's role at the V-Site was to pack the explosives tightly around the plutonium core and to verify that there wasn't even the smallest gap as this might disrupt the critical detonation process, which had to be totally uniform. The big fear was that in such high-risk operations, an accident might ignite the many tons of TNT stored in the huts. And so key buildings were surrounded by protective outer walls called berms. Now this is the berm back here behind us, of course, that was that was built as a protective device for the high explosives. And these berms really were designed uh, during the project to protect people and buildings behind it so that if there, it would limit the damage if there was an accident. Using original plans and new evidence from the site, our experts now understand how this protective technique worked. Next to each workshop, a 12-foot berm was erected, held in place by shock-absorbing metal rods and backfilled with earth. In the event of an explosion, there would be no saving the people inside. The purpose of the berm was to protect the surrounding area. The ordnance engineers who were sent into the workshops to assemble the high explosive charges were aware of the dangers they faced. One of them was George Kistiakovsky. 
Kiss Diakowski was asked by uh, someone, you know, weren't you afraid of, you know, drilling into these high explosives and pouring in this molten high explosives that they would explode? And he said, well, you know, if it exploded, I would never know. So he was pretty blasé about the whole thing. And I think they had an attitude that a certain level of risk was acceptable because, because it was wartime. By May 1945, two implosion bombs had successfully been built. The engineers persuaded the military to let them test one of these precious new devices. But there was great concern. Should the test fail, the plutonium might all be wasted. Ellen McGee has been studying this strange concrete bowl, which she reveals was a device to salvage the precious plutonium. They were worried that when they did the test, that, um, that basically the conventional explosives would detonate, but they wouldn't have an atomic reaction, and that the world's, or close to the world's supply of plutonium would just basically get scattered to the winds. The engineer's solution was to build this huge bowl over 220 yards in diameter. If the plutonium didn't detonate, the exploding TNT would simply scatter it into this pool. The water would be filtered and the plutonium collected. But with time running out, this approach was abandoned. The engineers decided to proceed with the test without attempting to recover the plutonium if it failed. The world's first test of a nuclear bomb was set for the 16th of July, 1945, to take place in a huge area of desert 200 miles south of Los Alamos called Alamogordo. Before this first detonation, the engineers feared that the bomb might not be powerful enough, or worse, that they had created something that was entirely uncontrollable. So one of the great uncertainties associated with the first test was how much energy that the test would produce. What would be the yield of the weapon? Indeed, scientists took a number of wagers as to whether or not the ignition of that device might cause a reaction between the nitrogen and the oxygen in the atmosphere, and thus ignite the atmosphere and cause a total conflagration. 27 months of work. Vast human and material resources mobilized in secret at a cost of over two billion dollars. It all culminated here with the detonation of the first atomic bomb. Local population reported a blinding white flash visible for a radius of 150 miles and audible for 200 miles around. A press release was prepared ahead of time uh, saying that an uh, ammunition dump uh, had exploded and that was what caused the um, bright light to occur on the dawn of uh, July 16th. And uh, lo and behold, that was printed in the paper and uh, people I suppose, said, well, I guess that was an ammunition dump and uh, took the newspaper at its word. Few witnesses realized they had seen something which would define history. The greatest force for destruction that the world had ever seen, born from the largest construction project ever undertaken. Uh, the logistics are mind-boggling. I mean, it takes 27 months these days to do an environmental impact statement. Uh, and these gentlemen were able to put everything together in that time frame. Three weeks after the test, the first uranium bomb would explode over the Japanese city of Hiroshima, and the plutonium bomb would destroy Nagasaki three days after that. With war over, these buildings were allowed to fade and crumble, they were hidden behind razor wire fences and a wall of secrecy. Communities like Happy Valley disappeared from sight forever. But their legacy lives on in a new generation of technological secrets born out of the lost world of the Manhattan Project.